But now we come to the main event, at least you're all here. And that's the talk by Professor Andrew Ray, who works for the University of the Highlands and Islands, based in Perth, and has connections with Orkney currently, being one of the main men in the um, work that's gone on at the airport in developing sort of sustainable fuels and uh, other things to do with aircraft and so on. But he's here tonight, of course, to talk about rather longer ago and the first years of the, our air service in Orkney. So I'll leave uh, Andrew to tell you everything else. <laughs> Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. Excellent. Does that work? I can't see anybody. There's a bright light there. Okay. Um, so, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, Moya mentioned earlier on um, the word eminent. I, I think either she doesn't understand the meaning of the word or, or it means aviation geek um, as well, because um, that's what I am really at heart. I spent most of my uh, early career designing airplanes for Airbus and Boeing before moving to academia. Um, but I have a, a, always had an interest in, in the aviation uh, sector in the north of Scotland. I'll explain why later. Um, but the, the subtitle of the talk there is um, the impact and legacy of the creation of airline services in the north of Scotland. Um, and that is linked through to the sustainable aviation test environment. And hence the logos here are, are the partners working on the project um, up at the airport um, and wider than that. And I'll touch on that at the end to show you how the work of the pioneers has helped to inform what we've done since then. So first of all, I should say thank you very much for coming out on such a beautiful evening. Um, I will talk to a, an empty room about aeroplanes, but it's nice to have an audience as well. That's a bit of a bonus. Um, so the things I want to cover this, uh, this evening are the birth of aviation in Scotland, so the early um, attempts at flight, um, and then starting off in the Western Isles, um, followed by the Northern Isles. I'll start with the Western Isles because John Sword uh, beat Ted Fresson to airline services by three weeks. So it's a slight advantage, but um, chronologically, I should start with the Western Isles. Then look at what happened with nationalization post-war, uh, some of the personalities, and then because I'm a, an aircraft designer, I'll talk about the aircraft, and then I'll talk about SATE and, and the future for aircraft in our, sec in our region. Um, throughout, um, you, you might recognize some of these pictures. Um, these are um, Edmund Miller's uh, paintings that he did for um, Peter Clegg's series of books um, that he wrote about um, the various airlines in the north of Scotland. I uh, had the pleasure of meeting Edmund Miller, and I have most of his paintings somewhere on my walls at home. Um, and they are very evocative of the period. So, starting off with, with early aviation. Um, and I should mention that um, what I'm about to talk to this, this evening is, is uh, based on a chapter I wrote for a book by my colleague, uh, Professor David Worthington, um, who's based down in Dornoch, um, uh, called New Coastal History. Um, the first draft of that chapter I wrote um, was apparently six times longer than it needed to be with the word count, so you're getting the long version tonight. Um, but if you're interested in the book, uh, that's it there. So the first reference to aviation in Scotland I could find is a guy called John Damien, um, who in fact was Italian um, and threw himself off the battlements of Stirling Castle, uh, Icarus style, with wings made out of hen's feathers, um, when obviously gravity won and he hit the floor rather hard. Uh, he claimed that if he'd been given eagle's feathers, he would have flown. Um, but I think we know exactly what would happen. Um, Alexander Wilson, um, nearly 250 years later, um, did things more of a uh, uh, scientific nature uh, when he used thermometers attached to paper kites to look at temperature variations with height. And then following the flight of the Montgolfier brothers in 1783, a guy called James Titler um, flew, uh, oops, easy, sorry about that, uh, this contraption in Edinburgh. Um, and there are several streets named after him uh, around Holyrood, which is where he did his first flights. Um, 
His first flight was about a half a mile um, and got to a height of about 100 meters. But that was eclipsed significantly just a year later by another Italian, Vincent Lunardi, who flew 46 miles from Edinburgh to Fife. And there is a, a plaque next to uh, the road uh, in the middle of Fife, um, and he's even mentioned in one of Robbie Burns' uh, poems. And then um, 1815, this feat wasn't even closely repeated when James Sadler flew from Glasgow to Morgai, which was less than a quarter of that distance. So moving on to things that looked almost like aeroplanes, a, a guy called Person was interested in what we call Lilienthal type gliders. So um, Lilienthal was a German who had experimented with manned gliders and had achieved some significant work in improving uh, how we understand mechanics of flight. Um, but Pilcher left uh, Glasgow University and started flying these type of gliders uh, near Helensborough and went to work for uh, Sir Hiram Maxim down in Kent. And Maxim, you may be aware, invented the first repeating machine gun. Um, but he also made a, a significant contribution to, to aeronautics. Um, he designed a whirling arm on the end of which he placed aerofoils to test lift and drag. When he realized that that was limited, he then designed uh, the first wind tunnel in the UK um, and came up with the shape that we know in modern wings, a cambered wing, which means it's curved from front to back. Um, so that was all down to Hiram Maxim. Um, while working for um, Maxim Pilcher got the idea of these gliders and wanted to put a, an engine in it and would have done so if he hadn't been killed in an accident in 1899. So there is a possibility that he would have beaten the, the Wright brothers to the first powered flight. But aviation is littered with if onlys and maybes. So state-sponsored aeronautical science was... was um, centered around uh, what was originally called the Army Balloon Factory at, at Farnborough, and a rather eccentric and flamboyant uh, American called Colonel Sam Cody, who was a, a Wild West showman to begin with, uh, joined uh, Farnborough and started looking at man-carrying uh, kites for observation, which he did in the Boer War. And he was joined at Farnborough by a guy called John William Dunn, who was the son of a, an Army general much more of an establishment figure and favoured by the, the hierarchy at Farnborough. And Dunn came up with, um, in aer aerodynamics terms, of pure aircraft. So his aircraft uh, is here. It's a swept, tailless configuration. So there's no tailplane at all. It's controlled only by um, um, ailerons at the tip of the wing. It was considered so advanced and so secret that it was transported um, the 500 miles north to Blair Athol, where it was flown successfully um, by the head of the, the RE uh, as it became um, then. But John Dunn got disillusioned um, and he went off. He was good friends with um, H.G. Wells and wrote uh, some books on um, the philosophy of time and, and other um, esoteric subjects. So he was lost to aeronautics, sadly. And then uh, it was Cody that made the first controlled powered flight um, in the UK in 1908 at Farnborough. Um, he walked away from the landing. Uh, the plane never flew again, so I guess it, it, it was a successful flight. Um, but Cody was, um, was, was awarded that recognition. So not long after, um, Captain Bertrand Dixon was one of the early, uh, one of the first Scotsmen to be awarded a, a flight certificate. Um, if you ever get the chance to read about Dixon, if you don't know his life already, I suggest you do. He's a fascinating guy. Um, his grave is on just beside the road uh, between Garv and Gerloch, um, on the road for there. So that, that's his grave up here. Um, and then not long after that, um, on, the, on the west coast, James Radley uh, flew some demonstration flights in a Blerio-type aircraft, a Pollock. And then in 1910, there was a large um, aviation meeting at Lanark. Um, they had 200,000 spectators to, to look at uh, over 20 different types of aircraft. Um, and the Caledonian Railway had to build a, a purpose-built station at Lanark Racecourse to, to um, accommodate that. And it was the first proper aviation meeting where speeds and, and distances were recorded. 
and then arguably the first Scottish Air Corps II up to Montrose. And then most of you will know of Jens Trigg v. Gran, who flew from uh, near Aberdeen to Norway uh, in a Blériot-type aircraft again. Um, 80 horsepower engine, four and a half hours in an open cockpit over the North Sea. Um, rather him than me, but he did it. Um, and his achievement is commemorated here by this plaque and by these public toilets here. Um, I think the public toilets may be a later addition. So returning to, to military aviation, um, the first military accident happened in Scapa Flow, um, not far from here. Uh, with a Sopwith Bat, which is this aircraft top right, um, hit some debris in, the fl in Scapa Flow, um, was repaired, then hit some more debris and was written off. Um, other notable Scots um, pioneers include um, John Gibson in his aircraft here, and then, um, I said arguably the first uh, um, Scot in a, in a Scottish aircraft, um, but it could have been one of the Barnwell brothers in this um, slightly oddly looking contraption. Um, and certainly Frank, one of the brothers, um, later achieved success as a, one of the chief designers of the Bristol Aeroplane Company. And of course, Beardmore, um, I was going to mention, a very successful firm established near Clyde Bank. Um, they achieved a license for building German DFW aircraft for the Royal Naval Air Service. Um, and unique amongst these pioneers so far, they were the first to set up a design office for the design of their own aircraft. Um, they built over 500 aircraft at Dalmuir, uh, including the R34. And that site is currently the, the site of the, the Rolls-Royce uh, facility at Inishin. So then moving on to the formation of, of the Scottish Flying Club, um, that was done by um, five ex-World War I um, military pilots who met repeatedly in Mrs. Crans Mrs. Cranston's tea room, which was the um, uh, um, Macintosh tea room um, in Glasgow. Uh, it took them until 1927 to formally institute the club, but it was a, a forward-looking and inclusive club and, and one of the, the people they gave support to was Winnie Drinkwater, um, who many of you will know about and more of later. But still, by the 19, early 1930s, aviation in Scotland was really the domain of flying clubs and air taxis, um, and still seen as a luxury commodity before the, the airlines truly started. So, moving on to the Western Isles. Um, and this is one of Ed Miller's pictures of, of John Sword's um, airline across at Renfrew. So it's created uh, by John Sword, who is the uh, well-built young man on the right-hand side uh, at Renfrew. A, only, he was a, a director of the Scottish Motor Trans uh, Transport Company, a bus company. Uh, he established a, um, an airline to complement the bus service. Um, it lasted only for two years because the bus service wanted to, him to return back to concentrating on, on buses. But in the process, it achieved the first scheduled airline service flight in Scotland on, on 18th of April, 1833. So literally three weeks before, Ted Fresson did the same from Inverness to here. Um, and two days after that, um, Winnie Drinkwater flew the first commercial service piloted by a woman. Um, and I've not found anywhere in the world to beat that. So it could be a world first. If you know of any different, please let me know. Um, so that, uh, we have the ubiquitous to have them dragging behind it. Um, and this is my grandfather, John Ray, who was one of his first pilots. Um, he delivered, uh, it's either this dragon or one of the others, and John Sword offered him a, a job on the spot and he took it. So not long after that, the first air ambulance flight was performed uh, out to a fisherman who had a perforated stomach in Isla, uh, flying him to, to Glasgow. Um, and um, he recovered fully. Um, 40 years later, uh, this is John McDermott, the fisherman, um, with the 10,000th air ambulance um, patient, um, Mrs. Ann Heads with her baby. Um, and, and this kind of ambulance, or access to ambulance service, created some, some novel community-based um, activities. So in Campbelltown, uh, District Cooperative Society was formed with a patient care plan where people could subscribe to um, uh, a cooperative plan to, to fund um, medical 
uh, aircraft flights, and, and similarly, um, uh, air ambulance flights as well. So as I said, um, John Sword was forced to return to, to concentrate on buses, and Midland Scottish Air Ferries uh, folded, but it was taken over by another bus operator, this time from Newcastle, a guy called George Nicholson, who formed uh, Northern Scottish Airways, also based at Renfrew and flying out to the Western Isles. Um, and that service was complemented by Hillman Airways down in, in Essex, connecting to Renfrew with a London-Liverpool-Belfast service a couple of times a week. Um, and although Northern Scottish Airlines um, would add Lewis um, in, the, in the Outer Hebrides to its, uh, its routes, that, um, that route was pioneered by Ted Fresson. So the first services to Sky were flown to an airfield near Loch Brittle, which is on the southern um, part of Sky. Um, and the reason that was chosen, um, I don't know whether you can make out, there's a big beach with a field behind it, so it had a, a nice big flat area. But also um, the Loch provided um, a, an approach route um, along the southwesterly direction, which was where most of the prevailing winds were, um, without having to fly over, over the Coolins. Um, and not long after that, um, radio transmission facilities were added at Glasgow, which greatly helped the, the uh, location finding. And then services to Barra started in 36. Um, and I've got here some numbers that compare um, the, com um, the equivalent travel by other means to the, to the aircraft. So if you wanted to take the ferry and the train, you'd have to leave uh, Castle Bay in Barra at 3.15 a.m. in the morning. Uh, it would arrive at Oban just after lunch. You'd then have a 117-mile train ride through Stirling to Glasgow. Um, so you, you've got the best part of a day's travel. If you could avoid the four-pound airfare, you could take off from the beach at Barra and be in Glasgow less than two hours later. And... Isla was added not long after in a triangular route, so uh, Glasgow, Isla, uh, to, to Barra. So this picture at the top there is, is John Sword's fleet in front of the three old hangars at Renfrew, uh, more of these aircraft later. Um, but the original site of, of the airport, so these are the, um, these are the three hangars here, if I'm pointing at the right bit, um, with the, the main runway that was built later. Um, this is where this set of runways sits now in relation to the modern Glasgow airport, so it's just across the river. It's not quite the same site. Um, the, the modern airport was created by the RAF um, at Abbots Inch, um, uh, and it's where the, the modern airport now is. Um, but um, when the RAF um, moved into Stornoway, um, they ripped up the, the airfield that, that Ed, uh, Ted Fresson had paid for, um, but had never used because the war came before he could start to use it. So I'll talk more about this later, but um, after um, the Labour election victory just after the end of World War II, uh, the, the independent Scottish Airlines were subsumed into British European Airways. Um, and in many instances, uh, that marked a decline in the air services provided in the Western Isles and, and in the Northern Isles, as we come on to, because they didn't learn from pioneers like John Sword, Nicholson, and, and Fresson. And in 64, Logan Air carried, started to carry the newspapers from, from Glasgow to Stornoway um, and operated for the next 10 years with only, without one single uh, missed delivery, which is quite an achievement. Um, and the, the station manager at, at Barra uh, retired in 1980. Uh, she'd worked for five different airlines. So now moving a bit closer to home. Um, I have to say I'm a little bit nervous because I'm sure some of you know more about this than I do. Um, I'm hoping you'll learn at least something, if, if only not to come out and listen to me talk again. But um, I'll, I'll start talking about um, more local aviation services now. So Ted Fresson um, 
created Highland Airways with considerable support from local businesses and the newspapers we've heard about, but also McRae and Dick, which was the motor factors in Inverness. Um, I see there's their road to the Isles out for sale there. Um, if you've not got it, get it. It's a brilliant read. Um, he served with the Royal Flying Corps during World War I, then moved out to China where he built some aircraft, um, some, some from kits from other manufacturers, some he designed himself. Um, and he started off by scouting various sites in, in, in Orkney um, when he flew to Kirkwall for the first time in his, in his moth. Um, he wanted to store the aircraft overnight, so he, he managed to persuade Shearer as the coal depot to store his aircraft there, um, which is what it looks like now. Um, it's just by the bus station. Uh, it doesn't look quite as, as, um, as posh as it did then, but they obviously gave him a great service. So that's the reason why we're here. The first uh, regular service came on the 8th of May, so the anniversary of that was, was Monday. Um, and you may have seen Logan Air's um, commemorative flight as well, which is quite nice to see, and, and Richard Fresson getting involved. Um, so a statue which seems to be based on, on um, that flight now has a, an ignominious place within the baggage carousel at Inverness Airport. Um, it used to be out on, on the, the hard standing, which was a much better place for it to be. Um, but you could get from Inverness to London in, in three and a half hours. Um, it doesn't take much longer than that now if you factor in check-in and security and everything else um, with aircraft that fly uh, six times faster than the, the Dragon would have done. Um, and Fresson complained that the local support initially was lukewarm, and that's partly because um, some of the local dignitaries had, had um, uh, interest in the shipping companies, and they thought that the aircraft would reduce the amount of time that people stayed in the islands and reduce the amount of people using the boats to get to the islands. He wasn't the only person flying in the northeast. Um, Eric Ganderdauer set up an operation for Aberdeen. Um, Ganderdauer is interesting. He witnessed Blériot's landing at Dover Castle when he flew across the Channel. Um, he also witnessed Trigby Van's flight. Um, so obviously he was, was, um, had got the aviation bug. Um, so Ganderdauer's first services were from Aberdeen to Glasgow. Um, but they carried an average of only three passengers each time and, and soon lost um, uh, a lot of money. They had income of about eight pounds, 15 shillings over that period against costs of about 450 pounds. So clearly not a sustainable business. So Fresson and Ganderdauer came up with a, a verbal agreement to split the services. Um, Ganderdauer would fly from Aberdeen and Fresson would fly from Inverness. But Ganderdauer soon started to um, cross over that um, agreed barrier. And things were made worse when the Maybury report um, uh, in 1939 suggested that competition was a bad thing and awarded a lot of the routes that, um, that Fresson had pioneered to uh, Ganderdauer. But while Fresson had challenges from one of the, uh, his um, contemporaries in, in the region, he got a crucial help from, uh, Ted Fress, uh, from John Sword across on the West Coast. Um, it was mentioned that the, the Monospar um, crashed and was out of action. Um, so John Sword lent him an aircraft, a Fox Moth, uh, and, a, and a pilot, Captain Coleman. And, and Fresson says in his book that without that assistance, he, he under, uh, that, um, Holland Airways would have folded. Um, and Fresson was a, had a, a astute business sense in some cases. Um, he arranged for uh, the north of Scotland Steam Navigation Company to become a shareholder in Highland Airways and persuaded LMS to have a, a co-booking system uh, with the airline that allowed passengers to book on both the train and the aircraft. So I think if you read the book, you, you get the impression that Fresson's real ambition was to connect the islands of the Orkney Islands together rather than necessarily with just the mainland. Um, and he always thought that, um, that Orkney embraced aviation more quickly than, for instance, those in the Shetland Islands. Um, and that's uh, 
evidenced by the efforts to which some of, of the locals went to create landing strips. So in Westray, Sandy and Stronzi, uh, they were demand, uh, walls were dismantled to provide landing runs for the aircraft. Um, then in 1937, um, services to Fair Isle were extended and then Stroma in 38. Um, and that was made possible by um, the inhabitants um, levelling a massive amount of moorland by hand. Quite an achievement. Um, and it was suggested that the air service is more regular and reliable because they, didn't, they were more uh, or less susceptible to the weather. Um, if the ferries were stopped because of, of waves or winds, if there was a 15-minute weather window, the aircraft could take off and perform its duty um, when, when the ferries were, were stuck on the jetty. Um, my colleague, Professor Donna Heddle, who, who runs the Institute for Northern Studies here in Kirkwall, um, back in 2009 did an evaluation of the social impact of aviation services. Um, and, and her finding was that it was the advent of the inter-island services that were of more importance than the link to the mainland. Uh, so especially with, with um, infant mortality, so children under one year, um, there was a massive leap in, in lives saved. Um, and our family is, is a testament to that. So that's my grandfather, my grandmother, and that's my uncle um, who had been taken to hospital in, in Glasgow. So as I mentioned, uh, Freston thought that the, the, the Shetlanders didn't embrace aviation in the same way. Um, and if you look at the, the um, connecting flights within Shetland, they, they never matched the, the extent or frequency that, that happened in Orkney. Um, and he was undercut on the mail run by, by Gander Dower of, of Aberdeen Airways, which later became Allied Airways. Um, and due to a, a curious regulation whereby... Um, if you installed a radio station at an airport for your own use, that automatically made that airport open to anybody who wanted to come there. So Fresson, by um, investing in that, allowed Gander Dow then to be able to use the airfield at Sumbra. So by his own good work and his own good money, he opened up um, the airport to his competitor. And the airfield at Sumbra um, was developed before World War II and is in such a state that at the commencement it was immediately operational with Gloucester Gladiators um, defending the airspace there. Um, and most of the inter-island flights happened from Tingwall, which is close, much closer to Lerwick, so much better for air ambulance um, and doesn't have the, the complications of, of the commercial services and the oil and gas helicopters going in and out. Um, and, and Tingwall was constructed by the local detachment of Royal Engineers. Um, and similarly to Orkney, the, the local residents who wanted aviation um, uh, did it themselves. So in Papastur, um, all, all six of the island's men uh, created a, an airstrip themselves um, so that the aircraft could land there from 1969 onwards. So that's up until the war. Now, a bit more on, on nationalisation. So, the first part of that was the amalgamation of uh, Highland Airways and Northern Scottish Airways, which is what um, Midland Scottish Airways had become to form Scottish Airways, who were um, based at Renfrew. So, it bought um, resilience, um, but it also reduced independence. Um, so Scottish Airways um, also included London Midlands Scottish and, and McBrains. Um, and United Airways um, had the backing of Whitehall Securities, which was part of the Pearson organisation, which was an investment company. Um, and that led to some not so good decisions, as I'll come on to in a minute. So with nationalisation um, came what was called a licensing committee established following the Maybury report. Um, and that was far reaching um, and elements of it still exist in the way that air transport and general aviation operations 
are regulated today and basically laid the foundation for the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, the National Air Traffic Service, and airport groups like Collins and Adams Airports. Um, we were talking at the break about um, how some of the, the safety that we saw, or lack of safety that we saw in the film, couldn't happen today. Um, leaving an aircraft empty with the engines running, um, you couldn't do today. Um, and I, I mentioned that this is um, one of the dragons that crashed at uh, Rousey. Um, my grandfather was flying it. He said he was flying into land and the wind stopped, so it dropped. It landed on the trees. You can see it bent one wing and the passengers got out by ladder. Three days later, it was on the jetty um, back at Kirkwall um, and flying within three days of the accident happening. Uh, that would never happen today. <laughs> So the adjudication of the Air Travel uh, Licensing Authority, the ATLA, which followed the Maybe report, um, didn't sit well with Fresson. He didn't like his independence or his judgment being questioned. Um, but the heart of it was to make aviation safer. safer. Um, and that competed routes might compromise safety. But competition, as we know, in, in the modern world can be good. It's led to lower fares. Um, but also has led to a drop in safety. Um, so it removed Scottish Airways' authority to fly from Aberdeen, leaving it to, to Allied Airways. Um, and there's a, a lovely story between Adam Smith, who flew for Highland Airways, and Eric Starling, who flew for Allied Airways. Um, each was under pressure to fly no matter what the weather, uh, to the point where it became dangerous. So. The both of them in the morning when they looked out the window and saw the weather would by mutual agreement decide whether it was too bad to fly and if so they would adjourn down the pub for the day um, and have another look the following day so they were not in direct competition in a dangerous manner so as i mentioned bea was formed uh, following the, the labor government formation in 1945 a new air minister lord winster announced the state um, organisations of which British European Airways would incorporate the Scottish routes um, for a variety of reasons um, and, and they're well documented uh, they didn't really work um, in the first year the cost of the taxpayer was 10 million pounds and that's in 1946 pounds not current pounds um, with a reduction in service so you got a worse service for lots more money a side effect of that was that it, it also uh, prohibited um, the activities of, of charter airlines and independents. Um, so the likes of, of, of Freddie Laker and, and um, Davidson at British Caledonian, who in their early airlines fought against the, the licensing authority to be granted routes and, and passengers. So there's a lot of, of sus suspicion that the, the Scottish division of BEA um, was just a um, an intention to um, salve the egos of, of, of the locals, but actually do, do nothing. And Lord Paulworth alleged that not a single BEA um, director had ever visited Scotland. And to, to add insult to injury, Fresson was sacked by BEA um, later, um, and with some justification viewed this as public theft. He was not given any compensation for the work or the, the effort he'd put in to create the success that was the Northern Scottish Air Routes. And because they didn't listen to people like Fresson and Sword and Nicholson, they lost all of that experience and that know-how and that, that lessons learned the hard way um, and turned a profitable network into a loss-making service. But they wouldn't let them go. So BA clung to these routes. They wouldn't allow others to fly them um, and conceded that, they, that what they thought were, were third level routes, um, for example, from Glasgow Tyree, were, were eventually handed over to others, but only following the formation of British Airways. Um, and it had been preceded by a proposal to um, take over Logan Air and equip it with three Trilanders for use on, on routes to Camelden, Isla, Tyree and Barra. Um, I love this sticker. Um, I, I, my 
father collected it from somewhere. Um, if you look at the, the tagline around the outside, it says, BEA takes you there and brings you back. I think that's pretty much the minimum you expect from an airline. Um, and if that's the best marketing you can come up with, I think you're in serious trouble. One of the things that BEA did try to do, which is now commonplace, is what's called integrated services. So they would have an aircraft flying, for example, Inverness to Kirkwall, which had just done um, uh, uh, Liverpool to Inverness. Um, so it's what is done now. Aircraft don't just fly one route all day long. They are connected. So the aircraft you get on at Edinburgh might have just come in from Milan and you'll be going to Brussels. That aircraft will then come back to Gatwick and then might go somewhere else. So these aircraft are... are programmed to optimize their usage um, over a given period. But that was probably optimistic given the vagaries of the aircraft at the time, um, and it resulted in, in unreliability of service. And, and Freston bemoaned this, that um, in a heavy-handed way, BEA had set up its own department for, for these operations without, without knowing what they were doing, really. Um, and a byproduct of that was that because they were losing so much money, they tried to recoup it by landing charges, um, which then had a knock-on effect on, on passenger numbers and, and services. And rightly or wrongly, Fresson also claimed that the failure to um, reinstigate the inter-island services and, and the island to the mainland services was one of the reasons uh, responsible for, for depopulation of the islands after World War II. So I have to wait until 67 before Logan Air revived the inter-island services uh, from Kirkwall to Stronzy, Sandy, and North Ronaldsay. Um, and in doing so, they became the launch customer, what we call now the launch customer for the Islander um, and use it for fair paying passengers. So Logan Air was taken over by the National Bank of Scotland in 1968, um, which seems to have been quite a an innovative bank. Um, they set up the first mobile bank in Lewis um, and extended that to Orkney with the introduction of the boat bank. Um, so I guess in some way um, the takeover of an airline was almost a logical progression. So one last thing on, on nationalisation. Um, when I grew up watching aeroplanes in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, the likes of Dan Air um, and British Caledonian and Laker were, were prevalent. Um, and they had survived despite the machinations of the state-owned airlines. Um, and Dan Air obviously, obviously operated services into Inverness. Um, and as, as Moya already mentioned, Peter Clegg, who used to work for Dan Air, um, has been instrumental in cataloguing a lot of the history that I've talked about today in a series of books. Um, and similarly, Ian Hutchinson and Eric Starling have also written some some excellent, uh, excellent books. So now, just quickly cover some, some of the personalities. Um, so people like Fresson and Sword and Nicholson were visionaries and pioneers. They, they saw a requirement, they, they worked out how to meet it. Um, but the people they recruited were, were similarly adventurous. Um, I already mentioned Winnie Drinkwater. So the top photograph, that's Winnie Drinkwater here. That's Jimmy Orrell, and that's my grandfather. Um, one of the reasons my grandfather claimed for, for leaving Midland Scottish was he hated the uniform, um, which, considering he later served for, for seven years in the RAF, is a bit of a, an, an interesting claim. Um, so as I said earlier, I, I can't find anywhere in the world where a woman was captain of a commercial flight um, before Winnie Drinkwater flew that in, in 33. Um, she learned to fly at the age of 17 in the Scottish Flying Club, as I mentioned earlier, um, and she became the Scotland's first women's li women licensed engineer. So she was licensed to, to fix aircraft. And, and this combination of pilot and engineer um, was common because if these aircraft were away from base and they broke down, it was usually only the pilot on hand who could fix them. So the combination was, was worthwhile. And as I mentioned, my grandfather um, left to Havland to join Midland Scottish Air Ferries um, and brought with him Noel Mavrigodato, 
Um, I can't quite see the picture up there. But, uh, I think the, the guy in the, the uniform, uh, the sort of white flying overalls, is, is Jimmy Orrell. The guy standing next to him in the tie is, is Noel Maverick Adato, who had his own personal Bristol fighter from World War I as a, as a flyabout. Um, and he had, a, he had a, a Mercedes or some similar sports car. Um, and Jimmy Orrell um, later became a, a test pilot for Avro, uh, including the first flights of the Lancastrian and the Shackleton. Um, and that's Jimmy Orrell here um, outside a caravan um, on Renfrew Airport. Um, when my grandfather joined uh, Midland Scottish, he'd just got married. So this is my grandmother here in their mar first marital home, this caravan on, on Renfrew Airport. Um, so, like my wife Heather here, she's probably an aviation widow, just the same way. And when you drink water, is sitting bottom left in uniform as well. Um, and then there's a Captain C.B. Wilson, um, who flew in Shetland, uh, who was a World War I pilot and later became a, a test pilot for Lockheed. And part of the reason these skills were needed was because they, they didn't have the modern aids and navigation um, that we expect today. They had a stopwatch and a compass. And trying to find Fair Isle um, in a low overcast um, with just a stopwatch and a compass requires incredible judgment. Even moving them on the ground could be, um, could be tricky depending on the direction of the wind with risk of them being, being blown over. Um, even if you tethered them down, the loads through the tether to the wing could cause structural damage. And, and both Fresson and my grandfather um, uh, told of, of takeoff being uh, in, a, in a strong wind when the, the, the ground crew let go. So you'd point it into wind, hold it down, let go, and the aircraft would go straight up. And then you point it in the direction you want to go to. And just getting people on the aircraft was difficult. They had to strategically arrange um, fuel bowsers and fire tenders to, to act as, as um, uh, breakers for the wind. So finally, on, on the history bit, um, some of the aircraft, um, which as an aircraft designer is probably my interesting bit. So just to contrast, this is John Sword's fleet at, um, at Renfrew, and we have the Highland Airways flight at Wideford. Um, which is just up the hill from the modern airport where the cairn is on the lairby. So we've got some fox moths. Um, what we've got next, there's, a, there's a, an ordinary moth, a couple of dragons, um, uh, an airspeed ferry, uh, an Avro 10. And then uh, in, predominantly in Orkney, it was the dragon rapide and the dragon. So start off with, with John Sword predominantly. Um, his first aircraft was a, an Avro 610 which was a license-built version of the Fokker 10. Um, as an aerodynamicist, I really hate this. It's just a wing stuck to a fuselage with, with no aerodynamic detailing whatsoever. I mean, it works, but um, it's, a, it's a bit Heath Robinson. Um, it was, had three engines, so it was rugged and reliable. And eventually, that wing was taken and integrated into a fuselage properly. Uh, so that's the same wing in, in a different, um, different fuselage, and that became the Avro um, 642. Um, John Sword operated one, and only two were built, so not a great financial success. So Fox Moth was used quite a lot by, by uh, John Sword. Um, it's essentially um, a Fox Moth, uh, sorry, a, a, a Tiger Moth's wings and empennage added to a new fuselage. So the pilot sits in an exposed cockpit up here with the passengers in a cabin underneath. And we saw in the film, the Monospar, um, designed by a um, Swiss engineer, a graduate of Imperial College, um, who had previously worked for Beardmore. Um, but he came up with uh, a novel design. So you can just see that this one spar goes all the way through the wing. And then this detailing here, which you can see quite clearly in the film, uh, gives it torsional rigidity so the wing doesn't twist. In the, in, so you don't need a second spar. So it, it's a single spar, um, so the aircraft was called a monospar. Obviously very useful because it, it had a, a useful payload, folding wings, and the reliability of two engines. 
another curiosity, really, and they're not, not really prevalent. I think there are only four built. Um, the airspeed ferry was designed for Sir Alan Cobbin, um, who is, is also one of the um, featured in one of the, the chapters on, on the DVD uh, for his, his Cobbin Circus. So Tiltman designed it really as a, um, a big cabin and a small petrol tank because it was doing short experience hops. Um, John Sword bought two of them. Um, and the first down payment for it was, was his own six and a half litre Bentley motor car. Um, so airspeed were, were open to obviously doing some good deals. Um, and the flat fuselage at the top here was useful for standing on. It's reinforced. You could stand on it to operate the third engine, which otherwise would have been quite high up off the ground. But the aircraft ubiquitous with, with the early airlines was the de Havilland Dragon. Um, incredibly, it was first flight was just after four months of, of design and construction. So from first idea to first flight was just four months. Um, I spent 15 years working on the A380. Um, so things have changed somewhat. Um, and I'll come on to it later. But the the payload size, so the 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 ratio of the weight of the passengers and fuel to the weight of the aircraft empty was massive. Um, and there's been nothing really like it since. So an attempt to come up with a more modern version um, took uh, elements of, of um, the DH-86, which is a four-engined elliptical winged aircraft, and applied it to a more dragon-like fuselage, and the result was the Dragon Repeat. So it's got trousered undercarriage, got lovely elliptical wings. Um, 728 were built, um, and again, like the Dragon, nothing really has replaced it. And I mentioned United Airways uh, had a shareholding with um, uh, um, White, white, um, white Securities. Um, they owned Spartan Airways um, and they were instrumental in, in creating an aircraft called the Spartan Cruiser. Um, so this is this cruiser. Um, it's maybe a design only a mother could love, but it, it's, and it was only used on the West Coast. So it was landing on, on the beach at Barra. It was being used in Sky. Um, and the all metal fuselage didn't take too well to the salt water environment. Um, so they were scrapped by, um, by the RAF when they were taken into service um, after the start of the Second World War because of the resulting ingress of salt water. So just a little segue into the Brabazon Committee. Some of you will be more familiar with than others, but um, the Brabazon Committee was set up during World War II to look at what aircraft uh, the Great Britain should build um, in anticipation of peace and to compete with the Americans. Uh, it was chaired by, by Lord Brabazon and came up with five different types of aeroplane, of which Type 2 um, was re intended to replace the Rapide and the, the Dakota. Um, I'll choose a picture here because it kind of links some things together. So this is the Bristol Brabazon, which was a result of uh, Type 5, I think it was, um, flying over uh, Farnborough. So this is the, what's called Cody's Tree. It's the tree that Cody, the guy who did the first flight in the UK, tied his aircraft to, to conduct engine trials. Um, this might have been Cody's tree at the time. There is now a fiberglass replica um, at the Kinetic site, which is now um, the company that runs the Farnborough site. And these are the famous black sheds um, at Farnborough, which have, have um, had some reeling done by aircraft landing on them inadvertently in the past. And one of the more curious decisions was to use the Junkers 52 on, on the Scottish routes. Um, it was a good aeroplane in its time, but it was already obsolete by the, the 1940s. Um, but there were some surplus ones. Although they were cheap, um, BA spent £12,000 converting each of them, which is, in today's money is a huge amount of money. But the main problem was that their, their BMW engines, most of which were time expired by the time they got here, um, were not reliable. There was a, a plan to replace them with, with Pratt & Whitney Wasps as were in the Dakota, but not done. The main problem was that these engines required a very specific starter. 
and the destinations that these aircraft flew to were not provided with that starter. So if an engine stopped, it stayed stopped. There was no starting it until you could get a starter to it, which meant that um, in the short period where they were used, the reliability dropped from nearly 100% down to 60 to 70%, and it wasn't long before the Dakota replaced it. And I, hopefully, I don't need to talk to you about here the Dakota, um, one of the most famous aircraft in, in aviation history. In BA service, it was called the Pioneer. Um, obviously, it was described by, by Eisenhower as one of the weapons that won the war. And then another de Havilland aircraft, um, the Dove, um, which was des another design for Brabazon's Type II designation. Um, the trouble was it, it was a good aircraft, but it had a very high purchase price compared with the Rapide and 50% greater operating costs, which meant that the independent airlines couldn't really use it. So it's no surprise that most of them were used by BEA. And then the Heron was a, a larger four-engine version of that. So they replaced the Rapides on, on many of the routes. Um, I've got a quote there from uh, Eric, St Eric Starling, um, oh, sorry, one of the pilots, I can't remember now, who, um, who said if, if you could see the seagull's knees, then the water on the beach was um, shallow enough to land on. Um, I don't think you'll see that in many flight manuals today. And then another aircraft that came out of Brabazon was the, the Herald. Um, originally a piston engine version of, with four piston engines replaced by a, a turboprop, the Dart Herald. Um, and these were used on the Scottish routes. Um, it, it's really a, a, a workhorse, um, one of the much underrated aircraft. Um, and after the introduction of, of uh, TV reception in the islands, apparently over 8,000 sets were flown to Kirkwall from, Air, from, from Ab Aberdeen. Um, And then replacing the Herald was the Viscount. Um, it's a notable aircraft in, in British aviation history. It's, it's the world's first um, turboprop commercial air, airliner. Um, it sold well in the US, which was unusual, um, and was used by airlines all over the world. And it, it resulted in, in, as a result of a, um, a change to the Brabazon Type 2. So Type 2A was a piston engine version, which ended up with the Ambassador and the Herald, and, and the Brabazon 2B was the turboprop, which ended up in the Viscount. So from quite a lovely looking aircraft to some less lovely looking aircraft. Um, functional, I think, is probably the politest description. So the Short Sky Van was built by Shorts as a, as a private venture in 59. could carry a two-ton payload in a box-like section, so it really was a, a shed with wings on it. Um, and it sold 70, which was quite successful, so Shorts decided to build something a bit bigger and a bit more modern, which resulted in the, the 330, which had the same cabin cross-section and the same structural concept. Um, and then the 360 was an enlarged version of it. But neither of the latter two were really um, very successful. Um, they replaced the De Havilland Twin Otter on, on the Barrow Run, um, but they had limit, very severe limitations on crosswinds and uh, where I could only use one, the longest runway at Barra. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that um, if you talk to Andy Smith and other people at Logan Air now, one of the reasons that they, they don't like the, these aircraft, types of aircraft on, on the beach is because of retractable undercarriage. There's a lot more places where salt water can get in and do some damage, whereas the fixed undercarriage uh, Twin Otter does not. So um, Twin Otter came back, um, uh, a bit like its UK cousin, uh, to have in Canada has, has produced some fantastic aircraft. They're a little more rugged and a little more uh, utilitarian than, than the UK equivalents, but they do a job and they do it very well. Um, they're safe and they're strong, um, but they're also heavier and uh, some of the simplicity in the aircraft results in a, in a decrease in performance, but, but very, very useful aircraft. And the Logan Air still operate three of them, um, although they've been re-engined with, with turboprop engines 
and two of them are owned by Highlands and Highlands Airports, leased back to Logan Air. And then um, aircraft, which you'll be more than familiar with, uh, the Britain Norman Islander, which still has a link to de Havilland. Mr. Britain and Mr. Norman were both um, de Havilland apprentices who designed, designed their own aircraft. Um, the Trilander was less of a success. It had 75% commonality with its, its um, twin-engine counterpart, but the fatigue load on the tail meant that, that I, I don't think there are any examples flying now because they've all exceeded their fatigue life. But as with, with the Rapide and with the um, Dragon, um, they can operate with single pilot operation, which really uh, makes a difference to the economics of the aircraft. And then, because I'm an academic and an aircraft designer, I can't... So this graph shows um, the maximum takeoff weight in kilograms of the aircraft ex uh, increasing this way. And here we have what's called the payload fraction. So this is what I mentioned earlier. It's the, f the percentage of the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft of which is payload. So if you have a high percentage, that means you can get a lot more stuff in that pays money, passengers and freight. A low fraction means that um, the percentage of the aircraft that at takeoff that gives you revenue is very small. So you want to be this end of the graph. Um, and you can see you have the fox moth, the dragon, the twin otter. Um, down here we have the monospar, um, the shorts aircraft. The thing that I really need to check is the Junkers 52 comes out up here and the Dakota comes out down here. So I need to check my numbers because that just doesn't seem right. But you can see most of the successful aircraft have been up in this part of the graph. So and finally, how that connects to the future. So it has already been mentioned, um, I helped co-create the um, Sustainable Aviation Test Environment Project with Linda Johnston at Highlands and Islands Airports. Um, you may have seen the, the hangar um, being erected at, at, at the airport. So the original um, iteration of that project started off um, two and a half years ago um, with five major aircraft partners. So to Ampere here with a Cessna 337, we're looking at electric aircraft. Um, Zero Avia had their hydrogen aircraft. Logan Air, we're looking at sustainable aviation fuel. Wind racers have a, a large capacity, um, 100 kilogram payload, 1,000 kilometer range um, UAV. And then a little company called Flarebright have um, a little um, payload delivery device which can run in GPS denied areas. Um, and the other partners mentioned here, so EMEC um, especially were very helpful um, in understanding how a, a, a test environment can be set up in, in a location like Orkney. So one of the reasons we, we chose Orkney um, is because of the accessibility to all types of renewable energy. There's no point setting up a, a low carbon aircraft if you have to build another nuclear power station or coal fired power station to, to run it. So you have an embarrassment of renewable energy in the islands, uh, including hydrogen production on ED. Um, and so that's why. Um, and, and Kirkwall Airport, although it's less busy than places like Heathrow, it has everything representative of a modern operational airport. It has scheduled airline services, it has general aviation, it has oil and gas helicopters, um, pretty much everything. So it is it's truly representative of the modern aviation system. Um, so we were looking at, at use cases. Um, rather than pushing technology on a community, we wanted to understand what the community wanted from that technology and then try to work out how to, how to um, meet it. Um, and looking at the airport, the digital infrastructure, and the supply chain as well. So you probably have seen the hangar. Um, so inside we have uh, charging locations. There's also one in the Logan Air hangar, I believe, as well, because we put it in there for, for Ampere. And there's some offices, and there is a connection point for electrolyzer for hydrogen. And uh, Ampere flew there um, two years ago, nearly now. So 
Ampere's hybrid electric aircraft, and then Windracer's drone flew some flights for Royal Mail, including up to, to North Ronald Sea, out to uh, Fair Isle, and up to Shetland. So these were the flights in the first phase. So we had from Wick to Kirkhall, out to the, some of the outer islands, and then up to Shetland. These are the flights planned for the next phase, um, some of which will happen this summer. Um, including possibly a flight from Kirkwall to Bergen by Windracer's um, autonomous aircraft, which I think will be the first civil autonomous international flight. And just very quickly, um, a couple of points about Ampere's aircraft. I was seconded as chief engineer to Ampere for 18 months um, um, and was responsible for getting the aircraft across to the UK, rebuilt, certificated, um, and then conducting the flight tests. Um, and Neil is in the audience, and, and Sophie, uh, who was with the SAIT project at that point, looked after me grandly at the airport, so thank you very much for that. Um, so here we've got a Cessna 337. The back engine is the original internal combustion. The front engine has been replaced by an electric motor, and this is the battery underneath. So inside that front compartment, I don't know whether you can make out this silver bit here, is the inverter, so we have an AC motor and a DC battery. You need to convert one to the other. Um, the black donut is the electric motor, uh, which sits just behind here. Um, so we've taken a lot of cast iron out of the front of the aircraft, which means that the center of gravity moved backwards. Ideally, we would have wanted to move the battery forward, but the nose gear got in the way. So the only way to restore the centre of gravity was to add some ballast into the nose. That's the first time I have knowingly um, added weight to an aircraft. Normally you're desperate to get it out. Of there. So the aircraft arrived from Los Angeles in a shipping container at Wick. We put it back together again um, and it flew first from Wick to Kirkwall, arriving in, on the 6th of August. Um, When leaving Kirkwell, it flew, it was intended to fly all the way down to Exeter, but the transponder went US, so we had to get it replaced at Perth, and uh, then flew non-stop from Perth to Exeter, and then from Exeter to Newquay to, to Land's End. So by flying from Wick, which of course is John O'Groats Airport, we flew from John O'Groats to Land's End. And then lastly, hydrogen aircraft. So some of you may have seen recently the uh, Project Fresen um, is, was being pursued by Cranfield Aerospace Solutions. They have now formally merged with Britain Norman, so it'd be interesting to see what that entity looks like in the future. Um, and Project Heart, which um, Highland Zions Airports and Logan Air are already involved in, is looking at um, an autonomous freight version of the Islander uh, for operations. So we've gone from, from pioneers to aircraft of the future. Um, and I'll finish on something a bit personal. This is my grandfather in front of a dragon at Wideford in 1935. That's me in front of the Cessna 337 two years ago. So it may have taken us uh, was it 86 years, um, but one of the Ray boys was back in Orkney playing with airplanes. So just to, to, to conclude, um, I've talked about the pioneers. Um, they increased, achieved some incredible results. They achieved reliable, um, affordable air services. And I think it's true to say that the, the, what they set up um, was, is still the benchmark for, for modern air services. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed for a, a very interesting talk and uh, so obviously very in, uh, exciting prospects for the future Absolutely. and we watch with interest to see yeah. what happens but really interesting talk about what happened so long ago. So does anyone have any questions?
Right, well, I'll start off uh, the, because my father used to talk about there being the, um, the airfield uh, at Howe in Stromness and Stennis and at Cumminess. I believe that was Gander Dower. Right. So it looks as if you don't know anything about that one. <laughs> no, no. It, um, as I said, I, I, um, from, just from um, the familiar family conversations that we've had, but also the, the book that Peter Clegg put together. Um, I'm sure there are people here that know far more than me about a lot of this stuff, but yeah. I mean, it was clear that, that I mean, Gandadar was an interesting character. Um, I think um, in, in some cases he had better business sense than Fresson did. Um, I wasn't worried about treading on people's toes, um, but maybe if they'd been grown ups and played together nicely, then we could have come up with, with, mm. with better things. Yes, and you seem to have covered the subject very well. <laughs> People want to, want to get out into the sunshine if there's any of it's left. <laughs> yes. I'm Magnus Slater. I fly for Logan Air now, in fact. Um, what visitors in terms of SAIT have you got this summer? Is there a Dornier rumoured to be coming up? We were hoping so. It looks now that that's unlikely. Um, it appears that the approvals for longer distance flights um, are going to be harder to achieve than they thought. Um, so at the moment they've got just A to A, so they're limited to Kemble, back to Kemble, within Kemble. To get the, they will never ever be given, so we, the ferry flight we did with Ampere, as I said, was 418 nautical miles, they will never be given that. Um, so they would have to do lots of short hops, which means lots of infrastructure changes, which makes it very expensive. Um, so I, um, if you've not read the accident report from the Malibu crash at Cranfield, it's worth reading that. And, and then that, that gives some indication of why the current challenges exist. And an airplane like that with um basically is storing hydrogen in the fuselage at the moment. So how, how would you foresee that coming outside the fuselage? It, it, I mean, the, the island is shown with large tanks under the wings, or I've, I've heard that there's roof rack arrangements potentially with yeah. um, hydrogen storage. These are all really challenging questions and nobody has an answer for them yet. Um, hydrogen is the smallest molecule we know. It's a single atom molecule, so it will leak from everything. There's nothing. There's nothing you can put it in that it won't leak from. If you know that, then you've got to allow for it to escape from somewhere. You can't let it pool in an area where it might become inflammable. So, so um, sticking it in a pod on the wing is great, but if it blows up, you take the wing with it. Um, that's aside from all the, the asymmetric drag and stuff that it causes. I mean, it, um, you know better than I do the, uh, the controllability of an Islander with a single engine out. Um, uh, yes, so to get these aircraft certificated is going to be a massive challenge. There are no current standards that cover these aircraft. Um, and one of the work, things we're doing is working with the Civil Aviation Authority to look at the new uh, things like certification standards that cover the aircraft. So things like maximum climb rate in an engine out situation. Um, if you've got a hybrid aircraft like the Dornier or, or Ampere's, um, or even a single, so Ampere at a uh, a uh, version of the Cessna Caravan, which has a, a diesel engine linked to a electric motor driving a single propeller. So it, it's, a, it's a single in, um, power source, but you've got two different motors driving it. Is that a single engine or is it a twin engine? Because the answer to that determines your things like single engine climb rates and other stuff, as you know. Um, and if you don't know the answer to that, you can't design a clean sheet aircraft. So all these retrofits are currently the only thing we can do because they're one of a kind and you can do it on a case by case basis. I guess you could relate it to a helicopter with a single rotor and gearboxes with two engines. Yeah, but that's a separate certification standard. So there's a massive piece of work looking at what other um, legislation and standards exist and try and pull them all together into a new certification standard so we can design these things from a clean sheet because the only way we're going to get the best benefit from them is by cleaning, doing a clean sheet. Good though the Islander is, re-engineering it is not the way forward. We need a, a carbon airframe with, with other things. So, so with 
with aerodynamics designed today rather than 70 years ago. But no, it, there is no silver bullet. Um, batteries are too heavy. Hydrogen's, nobody's worked out how to do it. So if you're, if you're changing a fuel tank in the hangar, what, what, how do you make sure that the gas that escapes from the fuel tank doesn't accumulate in the top of the hangar and where the lights are? Um, so there's all sorts of operational things as well. Thank you. No problem. I mean, but go back to your question. Um, Zeravia probably won't be coming. Wind racers are coming back with a, with a drone. Um, there's a, a company called Arc Aero Systems who have got a large four um, rotor quadcopter that will fly at WIC, um, possibly here later. Um, and there's another big drone company that, that's talking to us about flight testing later in the year. I don't think we'll see hybrid air vehicles, um, airship in Orkney anytime soon, sadly, but that would be a quite a sight to see, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, obviously, as Arcadians, we think we're very unique, but one thing that really is unique are the, you know, the very short distance to the outer islands in terms of flight distance. So does that leave a possibility that electric aircraft could work because the range required is very little? Um, Obviously, there's still potential for instrument approaches and yeah. you know, in bad weather and things, but it, it seems like electric could work on such a short route, maybe with battery swaps when they return or some such thing. Have you any thoughts on that? Yeah, you, you bring up two points we came across when working with Ampere. So um, it's limited to VFR, um, but we have to have enough juice in it to be able to divert to an IFR landing, and that means either Sumbra or um, possibly WIC, but probably Inverness. So for a 15 minute flight, we have to provide an hour's worth of, of juice, which means that battery is, is at least four times bigger than it needs to be for those short flights. So unless there is a, a guarantee that you can fly VFR all the time, or the rules change, then that, that perfect sub-regional route for an electric aircraft is not implementable at the moment just because of the regulations. Um, the swappable battery bit is interesting because um, as soon as you have a swappable battery, that's then a line replaceable unit which has to be replaced by a, a licensed engineer rather than a refueler. So the, the process has to change. Um, but I mean, it's one of the things we found out with Ampere that yes, we, we could do the inter-islands okay, we still couldn't carry the payload that would make it economic on the Cessna 337 with a bigger aircraft we might be able to. Um, but it was that diversion requirement that was the real killer. Yeah, it seems like there's an awful lot of, um, you know, these traditional regulations that are really not up to scratch for modern thinking and, you know, for, for innovation in the 21st century. I mean, if you go to a home build fair, like in Oshkosh and places, there are dozens and dozens of aircraft that just have to prove they can fly, yep. and they're, they're all really clever, and that, it almost feels like we need that innovation rather than lots of regulations to stop innovation. Yes. Um, from bitter personal experience, Europe is a much highly more highly regulated environment than the US. Um, <clears throat> an example is that the best way to have got Ampere's aircraft onto the UK register was under the E conditions, experimental conditions. Um, but the weight limit for that is 2,000 kilograms, and the Cessna 337 fully loaded is 2,250 kilograms. So we couldn't do it at an E condition, so we had to do it under a foreign aircraft exemption approval. In the US, you could fly an A380 under experimental conditions if you proved what you were doing was, was correct. Um, so the The landscape is more open to innovation in the US, but they also have more safety issues than, than we do. There must be a happy medium in between so that we can promote innovation, but keep it safe at the same time. Um, and one of the things we're doing in the current phase of the project is working with the CAA to look at what the future of airspace management might be. So looking at towards unsegregated airspace where drones and manned aircraft might fly together. Um, with the onus on the drone to keep everything safe, get out of the way when they need to. Um, that's one way we can promote innovation, but it's got to be done safely. 
So that relies on things like detect and avoid. You can, you can demonstrate detect quite easily, but how do you demonstrate avoid without endangering an aircraft? By trying to prove that you, you can avoid it. Um, but I, I think you're right, there has to be a, a step change in that approach. Otherwise, as you say, some of these technologies will just, they'll fall by the wayside just because of um, possibly unnecessary regulation. But the, the, I have to say, um, the CAA and the innovation part of the CAA uh, have been very willing partners within the project. They're willing to listen. It's the first time I've had a two-way conversation with the CAA. So normally you, you suggest something, you throw it over a fence, um, and it either gets chewed up or, or returned to you. Um, so having a two-way conversation is really positive. And, well, and we're discussing some of these issues. Thank you. Now another question over there. The, uh, the fleet air arm of the Royal Navy used rapides as short communication aircraft uh, in the 50s, but they called them the, the, dom the uh, Domini. Was it in fact the same aircraft? As far as I know, the rapide was, uh, the, um, the Domini was a rapide. Uh, it might have had a different internal fit for military use. Um, yeah. As far as I know, it's the same aircraft. And then they called, confusingly, they called the, the Havilland 125 a Domini as well. I think. Yes. Hi there. You knew there would be a question for me <laughs> in this one. But, uh, what was that time? I must go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to history rather than the future. I've been interested in the history of Kirkley Airport for a long time. And I'd completely forgotten about Gander Dower. And... Um, it seems that, it, from what I've seen tonight, he was more a plagiarist rather than a pioneer. What actually happened to him? Why did he fail and, and Fresen succeeded and we still remember him so much? Um, good question. I, I think plagiarism might be a strong word. He was certainly didn't worry about treading on toes in the same way that modern businessmen don't mind elbowing their way into a marketplace to, to achieve success. Um, I don't think he understood aviation in the same way that Fresson did. Um, and obviously they were all subsumed under Scottish Airways when after the, um, after the Maybury report. Um, I, I, might, I might need to be corrected, but I think it, aviation wasn't really his first love. He, he was kind of forced to do it as a business because I think he, he I'm trying to remember, but I, I think he, his true love was the theatre, and he wanted to be a, a theatre impresario, but um, that didn't pay any money, so he started an airline. I don't know, that, he clearly had an interest in aviation, because, as I say, he was at, at Dover Castle and, and saw Trigby Van, but I, d I don't think he had the same passion for it, maybe, that, that Fresson and, and Saw did. Um, so maybe when things got a bit tough, he, he hung his gloves up earlier than the other two wanted to. But, I mean, if you find out more, Neil, let me know, because I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think that's maybe it, does it? Yes, looks like it. Well, thank you again. That's been all extremely interesting, as I'm sure we can all agree. And uh, we don't seem to get filled in on the details of things we knew little bits about. But um, it's so interesting to see all the pictures and so on. So... Thank you again. Thank you very much. And let's thank you. Thank you.